Welcome to Question Time. Uh, well, when I say Question Time, uh, we couldn't actually afford the format rights for Question Time. So I've had to make some unnecessary adjustments to the format. It's more like, have I got Question Time for you? But uh, in terms of kind of uh, Sheffield, this is, in my mind, the big one. It's the leaders' debate. It's, uh, you know, who is uh, Theresa May? Who's Jeremy Corbyn? Who's Paul Nuttall? <laughs> Only you can decide. But, uh, can I just say something? <laughs> Can I be Ruth Davidson rather than Theresa May? <laughs> you can May? be Ruth Davidson, have of course to be you can. You okay. absolutely can. Okay. Um, but um, I don't want to get them any more nervous than they already are, so uh, uh, without further ado, uh, let's introduce the panel. From the BBC, Head of Documentaries, Trevor Surrey. From Channel 4, Head of Documentaries, Nick Mursky. And from Channel 5, Commissioning Editor Factual, Guy Davis. I've always wanted to do that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to need your help because I need you to all ask some questions to make this uh, work. So as we go along, uh, please think of some questions you'd like to ask these three most powerful people in uh, documentary television. But um, first, in our first adjustment to the format, I'm just going to let them quickly set out their stall about what they're about. So if we start with the brilliant Claire Sillery here, who's uh, head of docs at the BBC. In a nutshell, what is documentaries at the BBC about at the moment? What we're about is timeliness and scale and ambition, I suppose. If you look at something like Exodus, I think it has all those elements. It's incredibly timely. In terms of scale and ambition, it, there isn't a bigger story um, and an incredibly difficult story to tell. So I think that's what we're about, and we're trying to commission in that vein. I loved Exodus. I think Exodus is one of the best documentaries of many years. It's absolutely phenomenal and brilliant things I've done. Um, you've brought along a clip uh, from a series that's coming soon, which also speaks to kind of uh, what you're about at the moment. Yeah, so I think the, the also speaking to the same thing, really, timeliness is hospital. So hospital, I don't know if you saw that on BBC Two, but this, it has been recommissioned, and this is from the second series of hospital, um, made by um, Level One um, rather brilliantly. And um, shall I talk about it afterwards and let you see what happened? Yeah, on the, that's, so this that's happened in the first week of filming at the hospital. It's a clip which is uh, from a programme which is going to go out in a week's time next Tuesday. So then, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. It's extraordinary, yeah. So, I mean, kind of a, what a thing to be there when that's happening. But I suppose you make your own luck a bit by going into these big institutions and trying to see how they turn, you know? Completely, and the relationship that, um, the access relationship that Level 1 have built with St. Uh, with St Mary's and with the Imperial Trust is kind of remarkable, I think. It's also remarkable how they've approached the whole thing, because, you know, sometimes um, we think about access and, uh, and then go and film and then go back to an edit suite and sort of work out what happened sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. But the thing that's really interesting about this series is it's set out to sort of ask a question which was about how you take really difficult decisions with limited resources and not, not how you make a, a series about process, you know, with numbers of bandages and all that kind of thing, but actually how you tell the human story. So how one decision taken here will affect someone else over here. And I just so admire the way, like on paper, it's one thing to talk about doing that, but actually to tackle it yeah. and to put that thought into understanding the access and understanding the institution and where you put the cameras to catch the pinch points mm. so you can be ahead of a story and you can be with someone who's being affected by a before they know they're affected by a decision that's happened over here is kind of amazing. It's an amazing bit of producing. Yes. Um, I suppose uh, some people might say, it's kind of it, documentaries of this scale are getting bigger and bigger, and you need to have kind of huge access to even kind of get a seat at the table with you know big rig shows on Channel Four and some of these big returnable brands like Hospital. 
What, yeah. what, what can you say to kind of some smaller documentary makers who don't necessarily have access to a prison or something? So there's, there are other ways of, of doing that sort of timeliness and scale. It's not about the number of apps. It's about the ambition of what you want to talk about. And so we've got a three-part series called um, Breadline, which is following people over a year who are families and individuals who are living on the breadline. So you can have scale in that way, um, but it's not access to an institution. Or um, we've got a series called Gifted, which is another um, longitudinal series over three years, following kids who've been identified um, as gifted by their schools and who are on free school meals that, that looks essentially at social mobility. Um, so you can have series like that. And actually, I've got a clip sure. of another series. I just want to say one thing about this clip. This is the taster on which we commissioned a series. It's a bit of a flyer, but the director who's working on this, it is for 72 films, by the way. This it's an clip. excellent choice. Um, excellent choice. Um, but, the, but the filmmaker, Daniel, um, who was working on this, was out, did an absolutely amazing job on Hospital. So just the other thing I'd say about a series like Hospital for directors, like some of those big Leviathan shows, mm. it's not as much fun for Docs directors. This is an amazing opportunity, and Daniel really had a fantastic time on Hospital, which is, and really grew, and I think that's part of why we commissioned this. Anyway, it's a clip. Um, it's about Redcar, and it's about young people in Redcar, but have a look at the clip. So you can sort of see why you'd want to back that talent. Yeah. Um, so uh, it also seems like you do quite a range of tones in terms of, you do on the one hand things like the detectives and Exodus and kind of incredibly serious. And then you also do Exotic Marigold Hotel. Yes, well, we can't use exotic in the title. Oh, sorry, 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 it's sorry. the real sorry, the Marigold, real Marigold. Hotel. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Which, but I, I, it's brilliant as well. But uh, is that, why is that out of your department? And kind of, are you looking for more stuff like that? Or? We were lucky enough to... David pitched it to us, and we really, really loved it. And it's, and it's hard to get that warmth, you know, that, that warmth into the tone. I think that that's something that Channel 4 have done very well, and that, and that that's why I was so delighted to get Marigold Hotel, because I've envied things like first dates. Mm. And then the hugely talented David Clues brought us that and brought us that tone. Yeah. Um, I really love it. It's kept me sane. Like, mm -hmm. I love having meetings about that. And we've got the Marigold Hotel on tour, which also supplies endless entertainment. So, Excellent. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's kind of a BBC documentary's quick introduction. Soon you'll have a quick chance to ask questions to Claire. But maybe we can move on to, uh, to Channel 4. Uh, obviously, time of great... Uh, upheaval and change at Channel 4. Everyone knows that unless they've been li living under a rock or taking part in Eden. Um, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, Nick, uh, do you want to set out your stall about kind of uh, where Channel 4 documentaries are? Sure. I'd say there's, 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 probably, there's probably two halves to what we're doing. And I would say one of them are those big series, which are, they're also about scale. They're often about story engines that take you right inside the eye of a story. So in some ways, when you talk about first dates, I suppose what makes first dates work is that you, you are there in the moment where people might fall in love. And actually, if some people came to the first date session, you met two people who fell in love before your eyes on first dates. But equally, there's something, and the rig helped with that as it, as it came, that grew up in those big Channel 4 series that if you make a film about giving birth, you're in the room where birth happens. You're in A&E. If you go into custody, you're in interrogation uh, room. And there's something about those big series that, that feel they're reliable story engines that help say something of depth, something quite profound about Britain and British people. But you can, you can see all life. Often you can see all life and different, uh, and, and different stories about British society pass through there. I might just show the clip now, because I'm going to come on to the other half of what I wanted to talk about. But part of the reason, it, I just thought I'd show you something archetypally, one of our core brands, it's from Custody. But there are two or three things there for you as people trying to pitch ideas to us. There are two or three things I can pull out of that and show you things that we'll respond to if you brought some of those elements in a taster to us. But have a look, it's actually next week's Custody, so it's quite a core typical thing that we're putting out, but it's, it, you'll see there's the, some, of the, some of the qualities that we look for.
I'd say, what's, what's good to take from that in, in thoughts that if you're thinking that you might bring us a, a bigger series? Take the importance of narrative. It doesn't have to be in that form. It can be in the form of, t- of a couple meeting and will they fall in love. It can be the form of a, a giraffe giving birth if it's at eight o'clock. Narrative. I'd, I'd say the second thing is energy. There's, 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 uh, I think we've got a younger audience than the other channels and the need for a level of energy and that energy draws an audience in. But the third thing, and it's really, really important, we don't, we don't do access documentaries for their own sake. And what's interesting about the police and our access to the police in custody uh, is that what it does, it's a way of illuminating really interesting things about British society. So in, in fact, this actually, yeah, it's a film with access to the police in Bedfordshire, but actually it's a film about human slavery. Or if people saw Catching a Killer that went out a couple of weeks ago, actually, you, you, knew, who'd, you knew who'd done the crime very early on. It was a film about domestic violence. And what, we, what we're using, what we want to be able to do, is use those narrative beats to say something a bit more profound about British people today or British society today. But I want to say... There's, those are the bigger series. They often sometimes begin as smaller series, but those are the bigger series. But the other thing that's really, really elemental, it's in our chart, it's what we're about at Channel 4, uh, is innovation and finding ways of doing things differently. And it might be that it's innovation in terms of a, of a, of a different angle. On a, it's, Maybe it's using the rig in Three Wives, One Husband. Maybe it's just the perspective of... David Baddiel talking about his father's dementia and giving you a quite a fresh, different take on dementia in The Trouble with Dad. Maybe it's the idea of putting a rig into a gun shop um, or, or using um, phone footage in Secret Life, of the, uh, Secret Life of Prisons. But things that feel like you get a very different angle and probably the most biggest, highest profile, most recent case of that is the trial that I think some of you might have been to the session yesterday. How, how did you feel about the trial? I think it was a really, really, it looked, it, I think it was a really, really interesting and absorbing project. What I think was magical about it was um, it's really, really hard to get, to, to mesh that factual and fiction. And what I think the team did superbly was, was to make that work and make it feel, feel like it mattered and grip and hold an audience across that, that divide. Because there, there is a seam and it's tricky and it's challenging. But actually, it's our job at Channel 4 to look for those programmes and those ideas that have those, have those themes that are a bit different, that, that perhaps haven't been tried before in that way. I, I like the trial as well. I thought it was really innovative and interesting. But I suppose one worry is, with all these big rig shows, like, I mean, how many hours of 24 hours in custody do we do? You do, uh, we do. We, we probably... <laughs> uh, not anymore. We, uh, we commissioned big hours. Uh, uh, how many do you do? We've, we've commissioned, we've got... We've got 24 in the making. Right. They'll probably take a couple of years to go out because, sure. as you can imagine, none of them are that easy to pass through But compliance. does that leave enough room it to... Leaves, honestly, uh, what I can tell you, and I want to say to everybody, yeah, there's always, always... The appetite for more documentary ideas, more freshly thought documentary ideas, whether singles, short series, it, there's, the door is wide open. What, can I say one yeah, more thing? Yeah, please, please. And, and in some ways, actually, this is, this is possibly... It's possibly a tiny bit of a, as a result of having been incumbent for quite a while. But increasingly, what I, what I want you to... That's why I, t- I tend to have stopped saying what we want at 8 o'clock, what we want at 9 o'clock, what we want at 10 o'clock. I mean, you can look at the channel and take your own view about that. But what I want... I want people not to pitch what they think I want. I want to know what you want to make for Channel 4. What that means is, you might be really, really wide of the mark, but I want to know what your but, but it'll be the beginning of a conversation, and I'll learn more, and I'll get more interesting ideas. There's sometimes a tendency, and I think possibly the big shows have created it, for people to think, I, I want to create exactly what you've already done before. And I want to push people to think, come to us with, come to us with things that f- you feel we should be doing. I'm, I might knock them back, but I'll enjoy the conversation more than if I feel I'm like, a, like you're, you're trying to say exactly what you think I want to hear. Okay, that's, uh, that's all cool. Uh, let's move on to, uh, to Guy. Uh, hmm. It feels like uh, within the industry, people are pretty impressed with Channel 5. This is quite easy, but I'm hoping you're going to ask some tougher questions. But it does feel <laughs> like Channel 5 is 
punching above its weight a bit in factual. Yeah, I uh, think... What's the secret? What are you up to? Well, I think that uh, we had a plan. Uh, when we came here last year, we said we were going to we were going to push into documentaries in a bigger way, which we have. Uh, we have commissioned, I think, some brave um, shows and some big series. I think we've had a, you know, we've had a massive hit with Rich House, Poor House, probably the most talked about show this year. Um, we've got a breadth of, a uh, real, I think, a breadth of approach, which for us, as the smaller PSB, you know, it's important that we, we, we really play out there and we have a real range of stuff. So whether that's, you know, Gangland, Rich House, Poor House, the accused, our new 90-minute doc strand, all of that feels like a very different channel. And I think that that's, I think, in addition to that, a very strong 8 o'clock presence, which is, which is sitting there million after, night after night. Um, and some very clever commissioning, you know, some very quick turnaround crime docs, which have all done, you know, nearly 2 million. Um, so I think, you know, it's been, a, yeah, it's been a good, it's been a good six months, and I think we hopefully delivered on a promise for that. I mean, I've, I've got a tape that's a little bit longer than others. I apologise for that. But I, I just wanted to show a little bit of that range of what we're doing now. I mean, it's all in the popular idiom. Even, you know, the tougher stuff we're doing, it's still, I think, got that Channel 5-ness about it. And that's, that's the difficulty, is, is getting things we think our audience will watch. So let's have a look at it. So, yeah, it's great. So I'm still trying to get the principles of it. I mean, sort of, uh, you know, it's quite, you know, what, what are the principles of the way you're creating? It's quite a range there, in yeah, a way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, you know, we're a very popular channel, and I think that we have to keep one eye on that and think, how can we do something which feels like that dreadful word has a purpose? So, you know, you know Rich House, Poor House is about, you know, the wealth divide, class, and happiness. Bad Habits is about a selfie generation, my daughter's, and looking at it and thinking, what's going on? And where do you put them where it's going to really work? And you can get great access. So in a way, it, it's also doubling up as, a, as an access piece. So I think that what's, what's, what's through all of those pieces, really, is just, is just wh why a really good reason to do it. So we're kind of looking at, when we look at the sex business, it's like, how can we look at this differently? How can we do 10 o'clock and do this differently? Um, the accused is a kind of big brave piece, which is to, well, we do that, we'll do it in 90 minutes, because I think, you know, we're increasingly doing 90-minute films, which our audience are beginning to love. I mean, it's interesting, is also from a scheduling point of view, you can play them at nine, and you can hold that audience till half ten. It's a really good thing, and we're finding that that's working, with, you know, so at 15 years on, or whatever, at 90 minutes. So I think it does have that Channel 5 sensibility through it, but it is diverse, and it is a way of thinking, how can we be popular and mean something? I think and that's what it's about. Titles. How does yeah. it work about titles at Channel 5? I think this is a bit of an old story, if I have to say, David. Um, I think the days of um, some of the more extreme titles are probably well in the past. and We find that a bit boring now. But I think titles are really important. You know, Bad Habits is a really funny title, and you know what it is pretty much straight away. So I think that titles are important. We, you know, we are reliant on the EPG. We're still, to some extent, you know, we, we, people will go through the other channels, then, then see what's there, and that title will grab them. So titles are really important to us. But um, I don't think they are as um, key to that sort of tabloid sensibility of a channel that they were perhaps four years ago. Sorry if I'm out of date on that one. Um, so let's, uh, let's uh, throw this open. I've got some pre questions kind of uh, pre-planned in the audience, but anyone that wants to stick up their hand at any time can just uh, can get a question in too. Why don't we start with someone that's just uh, popped up their hand there. So let's get a microphone up there. Thank you. Hi there. Um, you've all talked about crime documentaries. Um, I just wondered if you ever get bored of true crime and if you think that actually we've moved from poverty porn to crime porn. Firstly. True crime, do you mean by that? Because crime comes in lots of shape, you know, different shapes and sizes. So on BBC One, you'd have something like reported missing, which I absolutely would not describe as crime porn in any shape or form. It's really important. Um, filmmaking, um, or The Met, and then on BBC Two, you know, you've got things like The Detectives, Chillingdon, I don't know, if, you know, those kind of things, and on BBC Three, um, things like um, uh, Love and Hate Crime, so they're always speaking, th th I don't think we commission things, and apologies to anyone who was at the crime session earlier, because this might now be a bit repetitive, but I think that we, um, we're always looking at 
first of all, public interest, and second of all, what else is it about? So things like American justice, it, it's about America. It's asking a big question about what happens when you have a justice system where it's elected. And that's a really interesting question, and it's a revealing series. So uh, I'd, I'd, echo, I'd echo some of that, but also you, we're in an environment where actually we're now competing with drama on Netflix and dramas on ITV. And what actually what we do need to do is uh, engage people in a kind of documentary world through stories that are dramatic and compelling. But I would echo that, that actually if you watch uh, The Catching a Killer that I referred to that was um, there's a couple of weeks ago, actually it was a film about domestic violence, but uh, if we had not gone into that space through, uh, through, a kind of to, through a crime story, you would have had probably half the audience watching a straightforward documentary about... Oh, it, it's a, crime is a, is a way of engaging people. It's not the only way, and there needs to be others. It's not the only way, but it's, it's it, a way of isn't drawing... Isn't there a risk that you're kind of getting viewers through the misery or someone's murder or, you know, someone being attacked? You know, I, I would, that, actually, I, I would sort of, in some ways... Actually, having spent some time with the family of the victim in the Catch and Kill case, I would say, if anything, what that, that family felt was that something came off that, the suffering that they had been through because the, because the programme went out and then became kind of a message to other people not to stand up for what... So you, you can say that, you can absolutely turn that on its head. And, and I do think there's a public good in it as well. Sure. Guy, okay, uh, what do you think? All that. And, um, but I think there's, there's a, something implicit in your question which I think is really interesting, which you say, why do you commission crime porn? You know, I don't commission for myself, and I don't commission for the benefit of other channels. I commission for what the audience like and want and the stories they want to see, and crime is definitely part of that. Now, whether you use it and you take it in another direction, you use it ways into other stories, of course, we all do that. You know, I give you examples of the accused, whatever. But it seems to me that it is a staple of television. And I think also it's very illuminating about the criminal justice system. When I did 999 What's Your Emergency, the reflections of the bobbies and the way that they worked on the streets is really fascinating into giving people, the audience, an idea of what policing is about. And I think that's important. I think it's, a, it's the tar all the same brush to say it's all police uh, porn. And I think that the audience want to see crime shows, so we shouldn't be arrogant enough to say we shouldn't commission them. Okay, uh, let's have another question. Uh, the man up there, the, the back there, could we get a microphone there, please? A couple of questions. Um, was ITV invited? Uh, <laughs> they were, but they couldn't make it. They, uh, they didn't do it Theresa May. They just, uh, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't be here. They had to get back for something, so um, sadly my, they couldn't make it. They were invited, yes. My question's about uh, how much room is there for humour in, in the work of the documentary departments? Obviously, BBC does Marigold, but what distinguishes you from um, Factent, say, or Popular Factual? Um, why should filmmakers come to you with something that might be on the edge of docs or have humour in it well, than go to a there. different There's three questions there. Let's, uh, let's, um, Claire, do you want to answer that? How much room is there for humour? Uh, there's, uh, there's plenty of room for humour and warmth, um, and I'd really like more of it. So if you have any ideas in that vein, that would be great. Um, I think that the, the thing about something like Marigold is that it's asking a question um, posing a question about old age and retirement and then allowing it to play out. It's not closed apps, it's not a format. Um, it's being followed in a sort of documentary style. So that absolutely sits um, in our slate and it speaks to a, a bigger picture. Do you want to speak to that, Nick? Yeah, I, I would say, actually, if anything, if you look at our output this year, it is, it's the lightest and funniest and warmest, like first dates and custody, that are the things that are probably that are on the increase. So actually, yeah, we'd like, I would, I would love things that were funnier and had humour more. We'd like to get more things pitched in that space, but we're very, very much up for that. You've got to still find, through the humour, you've got to still have a narrative that feels like it, it holds an audience. But yeah, we want a, a range of tones, I would say. Um, I'd say absolutely. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think humour is fantastically important and difficult to do. Um, I mean, I look, when you, do, you asked about Fact 10 and the clash between the Fact 10 doc sensibility, I mean, something like Bad Habits for me, and it was interesting that you laughed because that's actually quite a big test of it, um, mm. is that what's so lovely about that 
for me is that the nuns are wise and clever and knowing and outside the real world, yet t totally within it. Uh, they're good and they're charitable and all those things. And these girls thrown into it are very funny. And the nuns are funny because they're sardonic. And that's quite a sophisticated bit of humour. I mean, there's a wonderful bit which isn't in that uh, clip, but we, see, we, ask them what we ask the nuns in the taster what their ideal man was. And she, one of them says beautifully, she says, um, probably tall, probably mixed race, probably long hair, <laughs> a carpenter. And it's just a brilliant <laughs> joke. <laughs> It's a brilliant joke, delivered absolutely perfectly on camera, and that's why they're so brilliant. And that humour, that's, that's about finding humour in the real world, and that's a really difficult, I think it's a really difficult thing to do. Yeah. You're lucky if you find it. Let's have another question. Uh, no one's, uh, yes, question there, Mark. Hi, I'd like to ask you about international coverage. Um, some of my favourite shows are Exodus, I think it was fantastic, Tribe. Uh, Welcome to Rio, which was a few years ago. Those are unusual um, because there's no presenter. I feel most of your international coverage, particularly on the BBC but Channel 4 with the adventure, is presenter-led and, and it just feels, for me as a viewer, less exciting, less raw, less interested, too mediated, too formulaic. I'd like to see you being more innovative and more, more ambitious not just doing these one big pieces. Okay, let's uh, respond to that, Claire. Is that, is that fair criticism? Um, more innovative. Um, innovative for innovative sake, I'm not really interested in. So if there's an interesting question or a way of telling a story, I'm interested in that. I suppose you're um, saying in terms of international coverage, do you feel like you need a presenter to take me somewhere abroad? Is it too domestically focused, the, the output at the moment? Um, no, it feels to me like we do quite a lot of international but it is true that on two quite a lot of that international stuff sits in current affairs rather than with us so it is issue based um, and that that we do have quite a lot of experiential and immersive travel I think that's something that the audience like you may not like it but I think the audience like sure. those shows. Nick, does, so. ch does Channel 4 do enough international stuff? Well, is it all presenter-led? Uh, well, it's certainly not presenter-led. In fact, the tribe was a way of taking the kind of grammar of the way we were making... In some ways, the tribe was the family series 4, we, but, but it was in the middle of Ethiopia, uh, in, uh, amidst the, in the middle of the tribe. Um, we are doing one or two other things like that. We, would, we, don't, we tend not to... We don't make a lot of things with presenters, and I think it's probably... For us and for our audience, there's something about a presenter which echoes what you say that feels like your hand is being held, whereas a, a younger Channel 4 or, or audience quite likes to be dropped in the middle of the experience and feel they're dropped in that world and feel like they're immersed in that world directly. Do you feel an obligation to do international documentaries? Uh, I don't know whether obligation, but I definitely feel an interest and an appetite, and it, it, we have not stopped with the tribe. There, there won't be loads and loads and loads of it, but there will be more. And how about you, Guy? What uh, do you feel? Yeah, I think we're guilty on that count, um, on the exact count you say. I think we do rely on presenters to do our international stories, but I think that that is not surprising. Um, we're, for the audience we have, uh, for the slots we fill with the ratings we want, um, ben Fogel doing New Lives in the Wild, uh, whatever, is a way for us to do international stories. We, we don't have the space or the money to do, uh, you know, beautiful, expensive, aerial-driven uh, pieces about, you know, Latin America or whatever. We just don't have the money to do that, and our audience won't come to it. But I do think that we, uh, we probably don't do enough uh, international stories, but we are a very domestically driven channel, and I think that but I think we're probably guilty on that score. Okay. It's just something that actually you just made me think about this, that actually I was looking at it the other way around with something like, you know, what Keogh did in Welcome to Rio. Part of the Breadline Commission thinking was that we would like Keogh to do that here. You know, that right now we really need to look at that domestically. And so it's interesting that you asked that because we focused it here. But. Um, another question. Um, right up at the back there, can we get a microphone? Right to the back there. Okay, shout. Um, the first question that was asked uh, was how do smaller documentary filmmakers get access? But then you did actually just go on to talk about the guy that made Hospital. So I was wondering if you could kind of go over that question again 
And also, if you don't have... Oh, thanks. Uh, if you don't have uh, access necessarily to a subject, equally, how do you get access to commissioners at BBC Channel 4 and Channel 5? Okay. Um, sorry, the guy who did hospital, there were, there were lots of directors who worked on hospital, so it's not one director who was on his hospital. It was a relatively junior director on hospital that I was talking about. Um, in terms of, I'd just like to say something, before we go on to just general access, we have got a new director scheme now. Um, uh, for directors who want to make their first long-form film. I don't know if any of you saw Dominic Sivier's film that we're showing here about um, uh, at, the, at the festival, and it's about his grandfather and his relationship with his grandfather and his grandfather's inability, well, his, his sort of fight with um, dementia and refusal to accept that he has it. Anyway, that's going out on BBC One. Um, and, you know, there are new filmmakers. Uh, Sailor Hennessy's doing a film about... Um, athletes in their 90s that's going out on BBC Two. So those films are definitely cutting through. Um, on a, so that scheme, and just if people are interested in it, in the next month or so, we'll be, we'll be doing a new intake on that. So I would encourage people uh, to have a look at it. Um, more broadly, I would say you can email us. You can email anyone on the team if you have an idea, or if you want to come in and have a coffee and you want to talk about how you, what sort of indie it might be good for you to work with, or how to break into something. We're very happy to do that. Um, anyone else want to speak oh. to that? I, I would echo those things, because we, uh, we've got First Cut, which is 10 new films from new directors every year. Plus, for those people who are kind of often graduates of First Cut, we do a cutting edge scheme, which is to develop people who are just post First Cut to a position where they might make single films for the documentary. But I would, I would echo what Claire says. Email us, contact, contact one of the team. Um, they might nudge you in the direction of, uh, of uh, um, an independent company or come and see us. Uh, there's definitely an appetite for new talent in, in Channel 4. Why, we, on the website. Yeah. I mean, I think, the, I think there is a bit of snobbery around, and uh, I don't think we're part of it. I think that I've often um, certainly agreed uh, with producers and execs uh, to try new people on projects. We don't have a specific scheme in that way, but I often do that. Um, partly because uh, at Channel 5, I think our commissioning structure, we look after a lot of, a lot of output each. And I think that we perhaps um, will rely, or rely maybe the wrong word, we would expect our executive producers to come forward with talent and talk about talent, and I think that happens quite a lot. Um, I do think within the BBC and the Channel 4 there is uh, more resistance to new talent in that sense. I think there's, a, there's quite rightly a standard and an establishing uh, kind of... Um, uh, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a certain standard in terms of experience that I think is there and I think to deny that is wrong. Um, we try and we are guilty of the same thing. We know that we will take and we will use names we know and trust. I think that's probably something that's wrong with the business generally. Um, but I'm sure that the will is there to do it and I'm sure the schemes are there for exactly the right reasons. But I, I think, to be honest, I think that actually uh, there is a problem with access. I don't think it's a problem with access to commissioners, certainly not at Channel 5. You can email me or any of the other commissioners and you can, I will never turn down a meeting. But... I think, and I don't think, I think that's the case of the other broadcasters, but I think there is a, you know, I think breaking in is a, is a really difficult thing to do, and, and I certainly try to do it, and I'm sure everybody else does. I think, I, I, that I'm sure that, that breaking in is difficult, but I absolutely, you know, Sela Hennessy's film is sitting on the same channel as Nick Broomfield's film. I think that's quite a big break, you know, so sure, the sure. idea that you have to be an established director, I don't think that that's I true necessarily. I, think, I also think that yeah. you can be smart as a director about who you work with. So there's a guy um, called Philip Wood who, who made um, a film on BBC Three, um, and he was really smart. You know, he made a film about his dad and addiction, and he contacted Jane Trias and that was a really smart thing for him to do. He doesn't know Jane Trias. He's not related or anything. He looked at who else had made a film about the same subject. And he talked to her, and she backed him. So, you know, when she gets in touch and says, 
I think this is worth looking at, and yeah. I'm prepared to exec him. So you can be smart about that, you know, and you don't need to know the person that you email because they're filmmakers. Do you know, it's like musicians. Filmmakers will talk to filmmakers. Let's go I to another question. Or do you want to quickly say Actually, something? There's a couple of things I would okay. say, just because I think, I, I probably feel in the room, and also from the turnout to the first cut pitch, that it's probably one of the most burning questions for people. So can I add a couple of things? Please. Partly I wanted to echo what Claire said is that we had somebody, this was a, maybe a year or two ago, and he'd, 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 um, he'd come out of film school, and actually he'd just seen an article in a local newspaper um, about somebody who'd, who'd suffered this, this viral infection and lost all his limbs. And he'd got in touch with the family, and he started filming him. By the time he contacted us, he'd filmed about 30, 40 hours. He also contacted 2-4, which was also a good move, and he'd, he'd got underway himself. In the end, that film played at 9 o'clock on Channel 4. I do think there's a... I know it's a lot of effort, but that initiative thing to think, I really, really, really believe in that story and want to cover it. If you believe in it, I probably would say, don't wait for a commissioner, start making it and then prove it to us. Th the other thing I wanted to say is, I think, and in fact, I was talking to a filmmaker the other day about it, there's something about the big shows, and even though there might be a bit of you that wants to be the individual filmmaker, there's something about the disciplines of storytelling that you learn by working on 999 or hospital or by working and learning from those big teams that actually going into those environments for a period of time is a really, really good thing to do. And there probably are people who can climb through the world of television without it, but most people will benefit a lot from doing One Born or A&E or Hospital or First or what, mm. any of those or um, uh, Can't Pay, take it away, any of those, any of those shows. Um, so I would say those two things: if you believe in something, go for it, but don't do allow yourself to benefit from learning from some because the reason they're successful is they've got good story beats and that's good. Sorry, I banged on a bit. No worries. <laughs> but we've, uh, we're going to have a little interlude here in the format because basically we were trying to get uh, some more pokey questions. We had an anonymous question box, but no one put any questions in the box, <laughs> and then the box went missing. So instead, <laughs> basically, uh, what we now have is um, I delved into uh, um, the comments page um, in The Guardian, you know, the real kind of uh, where people say anything, any random old stuff, but it maybe gives some insight into what's out there in the ether and what people think about all your different organisations. I yeah. should say that none of these comments reflect the views of anyone at 72 <laughs> Films, uh, certainly not me. Um, uh, but this is, this is what people write underneath those articles. Something to annoy everyone there, I think. Uh, now, the, some of the uh, questions, uh, people came armed with questions they wanted to ask. I believe Ursula McFarlane is here. Are you here, Ursula? Uh, there you are. Hey, can we get a microphone to Ursula? Uh, she had a question she wanted to ask. 
Um, I think somebody mentioned Netflix and Amazon earlier, and obviously the documentary landscape is, is changing very rapidly before our eyes at the moment. And I just wondered, what worries you most about that? Are you worried about it? What threats does it pose to us here in the UK? Um, Guy Davis. Um, I, I don't think we are quite as, uh, kind of quite as worried in a way as maybe others are. Um, I think what's interesting about uh, the streaming services for me, personally as a viewer, and I think for other people, is the way in documentary those feature-length docs becoming really easy, sort of easier to digest and watch. And I think that um, the sort of and, and the box sets, the long, the long form, I think is actually good for us in a way. It's been, as I say, these 90-minute docs for us and the modern Britain stuff we're doing at 90 minutes just sort of feels more comfortable. I sort of feel there's a feeling that people are beginning to like watching at length. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I don't think, I mean, in terms of deals with Netflix and, uh, you know, obviously we are involved with some of those, but um, it's, and I, I sort of feel Amazon and the Grand Tour and things, not, it's not quite impinging on us in a in a so it's not threatening way. you. Uh, Nick Mursky. I mean, I think it just makes it more... We, have to, we all have to keep on our toes a bit more and we have to come up with things that are stronger and that people have more choice, which is a good thing. I think... It, I mean, one of the things it means is that people aren't watching nearly as much live, so we're actually... I think probably within a couple of years we'll stop even looking at overnights and we'll be looking at over seven days or over 30 days. And, uh, and people... I, I, I some of our shows, like if you look at the, if you look at the overnights of... At first dates, it probably looks, it doesn't look actually that remarkable. It's 1.2, 1.3 million. By the end of the week, knocking three million people have watched it. And I think we just have to, we just have to look at, look at how people digest television differently. Um, I think possibly, um, I, I hear what guys saying, and I think the things like the box set thing, the way possibly we begin to play things a little bit like the trial and strip things occasionally. Uh, I think titles become quite important. We feel like a loyalty to certain brands, and which of course Netflix has. They tend to be, they tend to be more single events. Um, but it's look, it's a moving, it's a moving situation, and we've all got to keep on our toes and and hope we can find things for the audience and keep the audiences engaged in all our channels. Yeah, I think it, there's never really been a better time to be a documentary filmmaker. I think what we need to worry about is that right now. On, you know, before you might have been coming to us to pitch ideas and this was it. But as, fil as documentary filmmakers, in a world where we need to make sense of the world more than ever before, that you can go and pitch to current affairs, you can go and pitch to specialist factual, because documentary filmmaking will take you inside a story the way that nothing else will. Netflix, wherever. So it keeps us on our toes. You I know, don't seem that worried, Ursula. Um, what, I mean, are you worried about anything in the state of documentaries? Are you worried about Netflix? I mean, I think, it's, I think Netflix is a really good thing because I think it's make, it's, uh, it approaches the audience in a different way. I mean, they, don't, you know, they rarely have voiceover, for example, so it forces you as a filmmaker, I think, to perhaps be a bit, um, you know, a bit cleverer. Do you think these three should be worried? Uh, I think the main problem is probably budgets. And, you know, I, I don't know how the BBC is going to be able to compete, certainly in terms of drama. I'm not sure in documentaries, but, uh, you know... That's us. Awesome. Can you compete in terms of budgets? Um, in terms of budget, I, I wouldn't start there. I, I think we can compete in knowing that we want to make things which have a clear purpose. Do you know, that, it's, that we are speaking to something, and when something is worth backing in the vein of Exodus or Hospital, then we're going to do it. Do you know? Mm. So... Uh, um, yeah, and I think uh, what I do think will happen is we'll be doing more co-pros and we'll be open to that. That okay. will definitely happen. Yeah. But I still think that, that we have to start from the principle about what are we about? Why are we commissioning this? Why do we need to tell this story? Why is it important? And sort of start from there. Okay. Another question. Anyone else got a question? Yes. There's... Yeah, is our um, increasingly ageing population influencing your slates? Um... Nick Mursky. Well, I, I, in, in some ways, we are the channel where our, our remit is to face 16 to 35-year-olds. So right at the moment, well, that, is still, that is still the audience we are, 
We, sometimes, we do look for broader audiences as well, and we want a broader audience, but our focus is on the younger audience. So it's and not So it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not big for us. Claire, with the average age of a BBC Two and BBC One viewer is 62, is that right? Yeah. Does it influence your commissioning? Um, I think there was a bit of a marigold effect at one point, when we've got quite a lot of, um, of funny sort of stuff in that territory. But what I'd say is it's really interesting with something like Ambulance, how young the skew has been on that. And we actually learned a lot from something like Ambulance, where the sort of drama and the, and the you know, that, that whole timeliness thing is not the top line, the top line is the drama. And then you can deliver the audience to really broad social issues. It, the young audience are really important to us. The thing I would say that is different though with the BBC and the others is that we have four channels. So BBC Three is pointing right at the young audience. It's not to say that the other the other channels like BBC One should not and must bring in the young audience because it's for everyone. But BBC Three is, is very, very focused on that. Guy? Um, I think it's influencing, influencing us a bit. Um, we did a strip called Mind the Age Gap very recently, which was quite an experimental thing to pitch young against old. It was a good fun and, you know, it didn't rate terribly well, but it was worth doing. It sort of felt like it was a really interesting sort of way of exploring the age um, gap. I think the other thing for us is that our big numbers, when we do two million and whatever, um, those big numbers on those big shows, you know, Can't Pay, Rich House, whatever, they are broad audience figures. We need broad audiences. So, because we're not like Channel 4, we're not kind of driven by that 1634 in the same way. Um, we are, obviously, you know, we're, we're sold on ABC1 and 1634s, but we need a broad all adults audience to get those numbers. So I think we are quite aware of that. And I think when we look at some of our shows, we sort of are thinking that way. Um, we're putting some uh, new money into uh, 10 p.m. ABC1 programming which will undoubtedly skew perhaps a little bit older. I mean, if we're looking at the sort of thing we might do on Friday night at nine, like World's Greatest Bridges or something like that, you know, those sort of shows that uh, we know does have an old, older audience but is quite upmarket. So, a bit, of so I think a bit of that, yeah. It, it, does your question suggest you think that's a bad thing? No, I'm just, I'm just curious, that's all. Okay. Uh, anyone else with any pokey questions? Uh, how about just there? Try and get some of, let's just race through a few because before we get to the last section. Uh, do you feel a rivalry between the channels? And by that, are you competing to tell the same stories or are you ever trying to stitch each other up in terms of where you schedule your, your programmes? Is there a rivalry, Claire Slytherin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course there's a rivalry. It's kind of, there is. Um, and we should be, tr I mean, if, if, if what it's about is understanding the world as it is now, it wouldn't be surprising that we were trying to tell the same stories. We might do it in different ways, but of course there's a healthy competition. Is there a rivalry? But also you want know, everyone else to be friendly, good. It's a friendly rivalry. We're, we're often talking to the same people about yeah. similar ideas, but we've also, when... In life, I mean, in life, we've often worked in different constellations. On Claire and I have worked together at the BBC, and Guy was at Blastering 999. So we've all, we, people move about. It's a friendly rivalry, but yeah, we're all trying to get the best shows. Guy, are you trying to stitch these two up? Uh, no, not particularly. Mm -hmm. We are, um, <laughs> you know, it's nice to be biting on the heels of people. That obviously is good. But the, uh, no, I mean, we're, there is, it is a friendly rivalry. I mean, we just need, to, you know. It's we, a friendly rivalry, yeah, it sounds it's like a friendly they're rivalry. saying. <laughs> um, uh, anyone else? Any, yes, question up here, please. What are you most jealous of on, on another channel? What are you most jealous of on another channel? Quickly race through, Claire. Most jealous. I love first dates. And I really like your Ben Fogel series. I really, we need more authored things. And um, it reminded me of how he was when he was on um, Castaway and the quality that this he had. This is a very friendly rivalry now. Two series that stand out for me because they've got a simplicity and a relatability. We probably couldn't have done it because we do A&E, but Hospital, I think, was outstanding. And Rich House, Poor House is a simple idea. And the execution of it and the casting of it was... Uh, uh, I thought the casting of it was exceptional because it had a warmth and you liked the contributors so much. Guy, anything you fancy on these channels? Uh, um, the only thing I... Re um, well, the only Not thing. Really. One of the things no. I really... No, <laughs> one of the things I really love is an hour to save your life just because I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, fantastic idea. It's really tight in the way that it works through and I just think that's a brilliant show and I'm jealous of that. All right, any other questions? You can have that. Yeah, question the there. Stuff. Let's get a microphone to you quickly. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, is there a sector of society or an audience that you 
want to speak to that you currently aren't. Okay, quickly, let's race through that. Um, is there a sector of society that you'd like to speak to that currently you're not? One of the things behind Gifted and behind Red Car that I'm really interested in is trying to get the older audience to look at the younger audience because young people have been shafted. And I think that part of the way of doing that is to come in through the younger audience but see the whole family so the older audience aren't alienated. So it's not about speaking just to the younger audience, but it's, but it's about making them included in the conversation and getting them noticed and valued. Okay, so Nick, do, do you know what I would say? Actually, in some ways, it's more about inviting... Mean, I think the key thing is more about inviting a more diverse range of people to come into television and find those stories a little bit different. There was a story someone came... Someone, there was, um, it was like a social diversity uh, entrance scheme at Shine, and there was a guy who'd come off a building site and was working there for a couple of... For, he was just there for two or three weeks or four weeks. He, he started showing the development team some, some tapes that some of his mates had been uploading, and they were... They were it was footage that was being shot on mobile phones in prisons illegally, and they were being uploaded to... That became Secret Life of the Prison, and that guy then stayed and worked on it and now works on custody. I think the important thing is, yeah, there are worlds that we're not connecting with, but we, it, it, I think the primary thing is we've got to try and invite people with those different perspectives and experience into work in television and br bring us those worlds. Yeah, I think what do you think? I think Nick's right, but, and I also think that there are... Certain young audiences who are feeling that nobody's talking to them on traditional television, and I think that that's a challenge uh, to, f to break through to that audience who are almost exclusively getting all their content online and have sort of given up on television, and I wonder what we can do. Okay, that's interesting. So you're not overly commissioning for old audiences, but you're all feeling you're neglecting young, young audiences a bit. Particular uh, parts of the any other questions? Uh, it feels like we're speeding up, like university challenge before the gong. Go on, it's a uh, question up here. Hi, um, it's been really great um, hearing about all the great decisions you've made. I was just wondering if you wanted to share with us any of the muck-ups you've made and how we can yeah. all learn from that. Uh, okay. Quick, uh, um, what have you messed up? I'm really good at punching myself in the face. So, um, one of the, your job as a commissioner basically is to understand the channels. As best, you know, you, you're trying to interpret and fit things that will work for the channel and for the audience. And when BBC, oh, mate, sorry, they need to go faster. When BBC Three changed from a digital channel to online, I rather arrogantly, I think, assumed that because I'd made a lot of stuff for BBC Three that I understood what would work. And some things translate really easily. So murdered by my father, those, those factual dramas, life and death row, the, uh, authored things, you know, the Professor Green th film. But um, I commissioned um, uh, with Jamie Bauman a series that I really love called American High School. It's so well made. It's brilliantly made by Marcus Plywright. It, we couldn't get an audience to it. And I hadn't realized, and I think I'm still learning about what a channel being online actually means. It was too docu-soapy, I think, um, to cut through, and it needs to be pointier than that. Well, and that well, was... I would slightly, yeah, slightly echoing what Claire says, the painful things are the things that are really good but don't connect with an audience because that's where you blame yourself because a really good team has gone out and made something amazing really yet good. it doesn't quite do what you want with an audience. I would say the thing for me was I loved, loved, loved the catch. It was, it was I thought, I saw every bit of why that was completely different from Trollerman but the audience didn't. And uh, huge amounts of work went into it. I think it's really special. I'm really, really proud of it. I couldn't love it more, but it sort of deserved more. And there are obviously some cock-ups that you don't necessarily want to name because people have put a lot of work into it. Thing, but, the, but the ones that are really painful are those ones that, like, like American High School, that are actually really good, mm -hmm. but you feel, and you feel you've got someone to put a lot of work into it. It hasn't quite got the audience that you, you wanted it Guy, to. what are your yeah, worst uh, mistakes? Um, I uh, commissioned a series uh, called The Week We Went Wild, which um, I think just was trying... A, it was well done. It's really good. It's about sending um, families who are at each other's throats into the jungle. And it just felt 
and in the end, I thought I'd, I'd stacked too many things that were likely to work with each other, and we ended up with something slightly a monster. And it didn't rate, and the audience sort of voted in droves, which is a shame because it was well made, but I just felt the judgment of that, trying to put those things together at the time the island as we got the time of this, just too much. Now, just as a last level, we're going to um, just I ask you all to bring a clip, just of something you loved, just so people can get to know kind of what, what you're really about when the service. I think we've just about got time, but you'll have to speak quickly in terms of introducing them. Guy, I think you want to go first. I'll ask you to pick a clip of something that you loved. Uh, yeah, this is the golf club. I'm a bit obsessed with the uh, kind of Jaguar middle management class, always have been, and it was a skewering of that, and it was a moment when I think the access open door shut, and people realised that, that there were wolves in sheep clo sheep's clothing out there, and you've got to be careful, and that, I, those, that film and others like it, I think is the end, it was the end of an era of a kind of true truth in, in capturing that part of the middle class, and um, it's not been opened since. Yeah, that's great. Um, Nick, I asked you to pick a clip that oh. kind of would it's speak it's to what you're it, about. It's a, it's kind of, it's, this, this one's a little bit personal. If I go back, up, and it's actually the very, very first film I ever commissioned. About 10 years ago, I, um, I, was, I was just an executive producer in, in the house of the BBC, and Roly Keating says, oh, would you like, I'd like you to run this round, and you can, make eight, you can commission eight films, anything you'd like to make. And actually, the very first bit, I thought, that is absolutely amazing, I can do anything. And then I found myself over a sort of three, four weeks thinking, I can do anything, why would I do that? I can do anything, why would I do that? <laughs> and slightly, slightly paralysed by infinite possibility. <laughs> and as this happened, an envelope came through my desk, and it was, a, it was actually a VHS in a torn envelope. And it was from uh, somebody who'd left film school, he'd never had anything on television, and this was never anything I would possibly have asked for. But when I put it, in there, there was, there was a level of quality, a passion, and there was something in it that made me, this is a tiny bit of the taster that he sent me. It was a filmmaker called Daniel Vernon. Let's who, follow and, Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Can I say one very quick message of the back of that? In some ways, I sometimes show that at briefings because what that says is, if you feel something strong, I, I would never have put out my first film I would like is a film about roadkill and badger eating. But when it comes in with conviction and you want to... So it's part of that same message. Tell us what you want to make and, and I, I, that's what I want to hear. Okay. Um, and what did you choose? And you, you give us a little intro to it and then we should run that as well. Okay. Um, I chose 20,000 Days on Earth. It's not, I don't know if you know this film, it's an autobiography um, of Nick Cave. You don't have to like Nick Cave's music to necessarily get it, but um, I chose this film because it's just inspiring to me. Do you know, there's so many ideas in this film. I don't know that this clip will do it justice, but on a bad day, I return to this film because every time you turn a corner in it, there's another just amazing, amazing way of doing things made by two artists who I think at this stage hadn't, they hadn't gone on to make things like murder. Um, it's, uh, anyway, this is the very end of the film, and this is a man, this is Nick Cave trying to express sort of the inexpressible. I'd never seen it done before, it's amazing. I just love that, it makes me cry. Mm -hmm. I just think it's so ambitious to make a film about creativity, to try and express what a song is for. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And, um, and I think that what, if there's anything that I would want to communicate, we want films that happen to you. You know, it's nice and it's relaxing to watch things where we know, we know how to feel and we know the story and we know the way it goes. But the things that really matter are those things where, I'm sorry, I feel quite emotional about this, but those things where you've never seen it that way before and a bit of your brain chemistry changes. Um, and it, the film has happened to you, and I think that's what they've done. It's so moving, it's brilliant. <laughs> well, that's pretty inspirational about that. what's what you want to get to, and so I, all I have to say is uh, thank you to Amy Richardson, who produced this session, and thank you to um, Erica Cornell, who helped produce this session. Thank you so much to Claire Sillery, Nick Mursky, and Guy Davis for doing such amazing work. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.